We live in troubling times, political, cultural, and church fighting at every turn. We live in a society that is simply upside wrong, where what was once wrong is right, and what was once right is wrong. Where are the Lord's quality leaders? Where are our modern-day Nehemiahs? Do they exist? We need sound teachers who present accurate facts as they relate to Scripture, who are clear and free from meaningless cliches and relevant to our current events. You know, men and women like Nehemiah, our study, Hand Me My Sword, sets out to present realistic observations to present culture while evaluating how each applies to the eschatological truths contained in the Old and New Testaments. In the book of Nehemiah, the man who led God's people is presented in three roles. Early in the book, he is the cupbearer of the king, a servant. Midway through the story, he is a builder of the wall. In the third part of the book, he is governor of the city and surrounding sections of Jerusalem. He was a true and authentic leader of God. Hand Me My Sword is framed within the emphasis of using one hand to rebuild while keeping the sword of the Spirit in the other. We are praying that this mini-series blesses you beyond measure, so let's get started with our lesson for today. Welcome to our first episode. Today's topic is called Nehemiah's Backstory. We're pretty excited about this particular mini-series. Nehemiah is considered the Old Testament depictive of Jesus Christ himself. We're going to take these verses given to us in the book of Nehemiah and we're going to extract the eschatology or the end times that is stated throughout this book. We will also go on to other books and other leaders that God placed in the Old Testament, literally to set up for the great Messiah. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. Most of the prophecies stated in the Old Testament were given to us by God to set up not only for the arrival of Jesus Christ, but also to set us up to understand the book of Revelation. As for our study today, let's take a look at the key points, the prophetic life of Nehemiah. We live in a world that needs a modern-day Nehemiah. Simple facts are Israel is under attack 24 hours a day. One by one, countries are turning against our motherland, Israel. On most days, you will see Israel in the news. How is it that this small and tiny country seems to create such a global crisis in many countries today? Also, Israel's political and cultural walls are down. The populace in general doesn't understand that today, Israel is one of the most liberal countries in the entire world. We need to take a look at some of the reasons why this is true. Since she's considered one of the most liberal countries, 
The culture that has crept into the authentic Orthodox Jewish Judaism becomes our concern as born-again, indwelt believers. And in looking at that, we need to ask the question, what can the body of Christ do to help her? Well, let's take a look at our scripture for today. This is out of Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. It says, The remnant there in the providence who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. There are significant circumstances and history behind how and why Israel was able to drop their guard so that the influence of the Babylonian culture would overpower their lives as they knew it. This is one of the key reasons why we need to take a look at the history behind the time of Nehemiah. So let's take a look at some of their history. At the time of Nehemiah, the protective walls guarding Jerusalem were broken down. The moral and infrastructure of the city was deplorable. The Jews were acting like Babylonians. The men of the city were lazy and functioned like cowards, literally turning their city over to their greatest enemy. The leadership was covertly allowing religious outside of Judaism to penetrate the hearts of their people, resulting in a pluralistic, lukewarm, liberal society. Does all this sound familiar to you? Well, even though the United States is known for dropping its borders, Israel and many other countries are in the process of being set up by Satan one more time to return to a state of affairs of the days of Nehemiah. The story of Nehemiah is so significant, it almost parallels to what is happening in global religions, culture, and governments. The reason why I'm doing this particular study online, I believe that the majority of the people, saved or not, need to understand that history truly does repeat itself. God usually repeats history to help people understand what he said even thousands of years ago. Let's take a look at eschatology of Nehemiah. According to sound eschatology, there will be no Nehemiah to be found in this last and final round. In fact, two prophets in the likeness of Nehemiah will be sent directly from heaven. However, since the age of grace will have passed by this time, these prophets will handle the liberal modalities of Israel through the law. Now just to keep the time stamp in front of us, I am referring to a time toward the end of the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. At the end of the seven-year reign, Christ comes in his second coming. Please don't confuse the second coming with the rapture. They are two separate events. And toward the end of this particular reign, which will be fully managed by Satan, God sends these two prophets from heaven. These prophets will do exactly what Nehemiah did, but in its final state. And the beauty of these two prophets is they will evangelize the remaining pure bloodline Jews. And there will be only, not one more, not one less, 144,000. And through their work, God sets up to finish the work of Nehemiah. But this time, it will be in its final state. Take some time and read about that in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. Now let's look at Nehemiah's character. Nehemiah was a gifted young man, he was known for his immovability in Judaism, politics, 
and ability to build. He was born in Babylon and raised in exile. He understood the ramifications of bondage. He grew up under a father who was passionate regarding the preservation of Israel. So much so, he equips his son with skills that mark the idealism of leadership to this day. In fact, present-day Orthodox Jewish leaders consider him one of their greatest historical leaders. Now, Nehemiah led three returns by the Jewish people following their 70-year exile in Babylon to set up a plan to rebuild the morale, Judaism rights, practices, and political rule. Little did he realize his leadership actions would one day become the last historical writings of the Old Testament, literally ushering in the birth of life, and prophetic actions of Jesus Christ. This leader was the needle's head of Old Testament prophecies. Today we know Nehemiah demonstrated the exact actions that Jesus would fulfill in Revelation's book. I believe that Nehemiah is the Old Testament's preview of the abilities, actions, and character of Jesus Christ. The methodology most known by Judaists and indwelt Christians, Nehemiah's mandate of rebuilding Jerusalem is by the way of keeping a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. Meaning while rebuilding, be ready to defend your homeland and the doctrines of God at all times. Something that we do not practice today in quote-unquote modern Christianity, this method that Nehemiah used propagated a form of leadership that has preserved countries and corporations to this day. However, due to the satanic pressure of keeping the masses of countries happy, the lion's share of governments have dropped their walls to unify under the banner of one world peace, even Israel. To keep our message congruent, the greatest percentage of countries are returning to the now-updated New Babylon stated in Revelation's book. The obvious connection, Israel and global societies will, indeed, return to the place Nehemiah and God's people were once in bondage. Now you can read more about that in Revelation 18 verses 1 through 21. Let's take a look that there is nothing new under the sun. Solomon once said, there is nothing new under the sun. No truer words. Satan is predictable. Since he is not an originator, he reuses the same madness methods throughout continuous history. The key note to remember is, Babylon has and will continue to be Satan's kingdom of darkness until it is all over. Many eschatologists consider America to be this new Babylon. While I get their logic in this claim, Babylon is a global system of function in belief and governance. If you look carefully, you can see symbols, rhetoric, and religious beliefs splattered throughout every country in our modern world today. Satan is relentless in embedding his system of religious governance in every culture, country, and individualized belief of our global society. The main symbol that has been in existence with old Babylon is the all-seeing eye. It's actually historically stated as Horus, or Her. In ancient Egypt is one of the most significant ancient Egyptian Babylonian deities who serve many functions. Most notably, God of Kingship. In fact, that's the definition. God of Kingship and the Sky, Principality of the Air. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, 
Horus is ultimately depicted as a feminine god that rules all kings. Revelation's book refers to this entity as Jezebel. Read it for yourself in Revelation 2.20. Back in Nehemiah's day, he fought this Horus influence that was permeating Israel. While the Israelites were in bondage to Egypt, they integrated this she-god into Judaism, which later surfaced as feminism throughout the modern cultures. Since Nehemiah was more than familiar with this demonic ideology, he set out to rid this she-god from the land of Israel. This was his primary motive hidden behind his God-sized ability to lead and rebuild. Our ministry in particular is destined to accomplish Nehemiah's objective in modern times. That's why we're calling this mini-series Hand Me My Sword, which of course is a study to bring back the methods, principles, and a call to renounce the new Babylon soon to arrive on the doorstep of humanity in the end times. This makes the book of Nehemiah not only congruent, but absolutely necessary to study today. Let's take a look at our primary principles in our study. Keep these in mind. Since it's proven that most listeners only pick up about 2% of what's being said, this is a great way to keep the primary points of communication clear and upfront. Number one, God always maintains a remnant in each generation. That's a fact. Two, when a city or culture falls, God is known for raising Nehemiahs in every single generation. Number three, when men act as cowards, God shifts into high gear and he raises up and reveals a hero of our age. Number four, God only uses leaders who are immovable in beliefs, politics, and leadership. Nehemiah certainly filled that mandate. I am eternally thankful that God gave us the story of Nehemiah. Although it's not a story, really, it was an action that God took through this young man to preserve the land of Israel, to take back what belonged to them. And as we go through our historical study, not only in Nehemiah, but other major and minor prophets, we will discover Israel, for some reason, dishes up their culture, their beliefs, and their leadership, and hand it right back to the Babylonians. Well, we're going to talk about why they keep doing this. Coming up next is Zero Two, Nehemiah's Journey. We're going to dive deep into the proof that is in the pudding about Nehemiah being the one who wrote this book. Jewish tradition identifies Nehemiah himself as the primary author of this historical book. Much of the book is written from his first person perspective. That's a document that not only can we trust in Christ, but we can trust in history. We hope that you come back and join us for our next message or episode where we have some very exciting things to cover about this unique young man called Nehemiah. Thank you for joining us. We deeply appreciate it. We know that you have plenty of items on your menu of biblical studies, podcasts to listen to, broadcasts to listen to, so for you to take the time to listen to this mini-series, we are grateful before the living God. Until next time.